uh, out of three uh, series on biodiversity, the introduction today. Um, and uh, in general, this uh, series aims to give us some tools in the context of biodiversity or more knowledge to make it easier for us to integrate it into um, our work and somehow see how we can yeah, mainstream it is in our uh, works and how we can um, yeah, uh, make it more accessible for us and our partners, etc. And we have, uh, we are glad to have Jutta with us. Jutta has been working with us for a long time, many, many years. Um, we have made a, 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 yeah, you've written a long, a lot of articles for us as well. We have a dossier with you on biodiversity um, uh, offsets, etc. cetera. And um, um, maybe you can give a big, big, a short background on yourself as well when you introduce yourself. And um, um, yeah, you will give us an introduction today why biodiversity matters, why it is so important, and um, how it interlinks with other spheres of uh, our works. And thank an you. Overview to some solutions. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Johanna, for the introduction and uh, to the Bell Foundation for organizing the series. My name is Jutta Kill, and maybe before I say uh, much more than that, uh, to say I am calling in from uh, Western Africa, and I've been some power cuts the last two days. So um, if I do disappear, usually they are over in a few minutes. So if I'm gone for a moment, then um, I, I will call back in. This wasn't foreseen a last minute change in my agenda, and I apologize for that. Um, so let's cross fingers that it works well for the next hour and we will have a good discussion. So I'm Jutta Kiel. I have worked with the Heinrich Böll Foundation on various projects and um, activities for, well, over 15 years, I would say, maybe 20. Uh, I work both as a freelance researcher and activist around questions of certification, green economy, and what the impact of those uh, green economy initiatives are for communities and community rights. I also work part-time with the World Rainforest Movement, an organization based in uh, Uruguay in Latin America, focusing very much on the right, on the same uh, topics, uh, linking communities in struggle for their land uh, with, um, with each other uh, to strengthen their own struggles for, for land and right to, to land and decision-making over land. Um, I will leave it there and um, move into uh, sharing the slides that I prepared with you, saying at the same time, um, we're a relatively small group, so, um, let's say feel free to um to jump in at any time with questions with challenges with additional comments let's make it a bit of a conversation um whenever you you want to and uh christine maybe you can um let me share um give me the the sharing so i can i can jump in and share the slides I think because I was kicked out, you need to activate the, the screen share again for me, please. Um, While well, we saw it, that little are there. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so why does biodiversity matter? And I put in um, parentheses um, here on underneath why it also matters, how we really understand biodiversity. And I do want to emphasize that thinking of ways of integrating uh, biodiversity and also the, the immensely fast loss of biodiversity better in our own work. Um, and I will come to that uh, in the second part of the, of the slides to really address why it also matters, how we understand and how we look at biodiversity and therefore why biodiversity really matters a lot in our work and also in um, how communities and those who have guarded biodiversity will get through the many crises or many phases of the crisis that we face. Um, just as a um, quick reminder to say, um, the level of destruction that we are seeing to die in terms of biodiversity loss. And I think rather than loss, we need to focus on the destruction. It's an active act of destruction. It's quite phenomenal and hard to grasp. Uh, since the end of the 16th century, 
we have lost almost uh, 700 vertebrate species and um, many, many plant species as well. Um, to give an idea of the speed of um, background extinction, of course, some species have always also naturally gone extinct. Um, but only looking at the species level of biodiversity, um, the, the rate of loss and destruction is 10 to 1,000 times faster um, then it would be without the destructive uh, human industrial intervention. So many people um, and experts speak also about a mass extinction event. Um, and the first one in the Earth's history where we can clearly say it's driven by, often people say human activity. I would specify that and say human industrial activity because it's not every kind of human activity. That, that is driving biodiversity destruction. And of course, with biodiversity destruction or with species destruction, um, the other levels of the destruction of biological diversity are at the genetic level. We're also losing a lot of variety within each species to adapt to new um, necessities and to changing environmental conditions. And at the macro level, we're also um, seeing a lot of the habitat destruction, fragmentation and degradation, which then in turn, of course, has an impact again on the possibility for species to survive or to, um, to go extinct. <clears throat> Excuse me. One graph that I always find explains the, the phenomenal and the scary scale of loss quite well is this graph that the Guardian published at some point, roughly 50,000 years ago, um, scientists estimate that the ratio between human and non-human life was 1% um, in terms of biomass um, as a proxy for species diversity. So humans made up roughly 1% of the living biomass and non-human life made up roughly 99% of, uh, of biomass. When we look at the situation today, we see that if we take humans and mammals and livestock together, so animals create uh, animals reared um, for the purpose of human consumption, um, we have see almost a reversal of the percentage of biomass uh, of humans and for human consumption and use uh, versus non-human life. Um, and that's the biggest change in that reversal um, has taken place in more or less the last 200 years. Um, and you know, 200 years is roughly also the period of time where we look back at the industrial revolution uh, and the industrial exploitation of, of uh, fossil fuels. Um, responses to the biodiversity crises uh, there have been many. <laughs> as long as I would say the crisis has been so evident, there have been many responses, decades and really, really decades of conservation initiatives. If I had listed them, we would have spent half an hour going through the initiative list. Um, that's why I only put four highlights uh, or four lines, but there, there's no shortage of initiatives. Um, to address uh, uh, the biodiversity crisis. There's also no, no um, shortage of commitments by head of states and corporations to implement measures to halt biodiversity uh, loss and destruction. The reality, however, remains that biodiversity destruction continues and it even keeps accelerating. So looking at our work as civil society organizations, um, that rapid evolution of continued biodiversity destruction also mandates that maybe we take time to take stock of why those initiatives have failed so that we don't pile on more initiatives that have no, not even a chance uh, to succeed. Uh, time is kind of running out for um, experimenting with things that we can foresee uh, won't, be, won't be working. Um, and that's when um, I want to do a short excursion, a note on uh, the importance really of language and context and concepts in the um, discussion around biodiversity, because concepts and language through which concepts are expressed, they are contested sites. Um, language is always political, it is never neutral. Um, and uh, so <laughs> concepts and the language we use to express certain concept, concepts, they are 
a side of political struggle and there are contested sides. So it's important to reflect on how terms that are contested are being perceived by different actors. When we look at biodiversity and how it is perceived by many of the communities that have been the guardians whose territories today um, are the hotspots of biological diversity, um, we see that historically, the concept of biodiversity has been used to evict people from their territories and to impose outside control over the use of ancestral lands of communities. So for many uh, of those communities that have been guarding and have been the, the, the guardians of biodiversity protection, um, the connection with um, biodiversity actually is one of, of, of eviction. Um, so the, we need to keep that in mind. And there is at some point, a choice to be made and to be clearly stated how we understand biodiversity. Because from that understanding, from the clarification of the understanding, follows the kind of actions and activities that will be coming up, that will be discussed, that will be prioritized. So it's a choice to be made at the end of the day, whether biodiversity protection first and foremost comes with the focus and priority on photogenic mammals and landscapes as it has been for a long uh, time in the past, or whether we look at biological diversity as um, a concept that's very much and very strongly connected with the cultural bi biodiversity or the cultural diversity of uh, forms of life and the value systems that uh, determine how land and therefore by extension, uh, the biodiversity on the land is being treated. So uh, the protection often referred to also as a fortress conservation, uh, conservation uh, without people approach versus looking at biodiversity um, and biological diversity protection through the lens of um, protecting and strengthening territories of life and the rights um, that come with the territories. Um, so it's um, you know, a re quick recap of also the scale of, um, of impact and eviction that the past understanding and the dominant understanding of biodiversity conservation really has caused. Estimates, and they are, as you see in the numbers, very, very rough estimates, um, go from 10 to 40 million people that have been evicted over the course of the last bit more than 100 years in the name of biodiversity conservation. And maybe uh, sort of to interrupt quickly, I cannot see you all on the screen, so I cannot see if one of you has your hand up. Um, so maybe my proposal, if you want to jump in at any one point, uh, just, uh, just jump in or maybe Christine, uh, you can keep an eye on that because I realize I invited um, conversation, but I can't actually moderate it because I do not see uh, you all on the screen. So the experience um, for many with biodiversity protection has a very colonial flavor. Um, as I said, is associated with the fortress conservation approach with outsiders determining that some part of uh, land has a high conservation and a high biodiversity value and other part of land or territory is disposable, discardable. Um, so th there is a challenge um, to address or a reality to be aware of when we think today of how to integrate biodiversity and particularly biodiversity protection in our work, to be mindful that there is that experience where protection of biodiversity, talk about protection of biodiversity comes with a colonial flavor. So it needs to be clear that if that's not what we want and what we mean, it has to be very clear uh, in how we express um, what biodiversity protection is about, that it is also about cultural diversity and the protection of cultural diversity and those who uh, have guarded the rights of those who have guarded that um, diversity. So what lessons can we draw from the past global approaches to protect biodiversity if we see that really they, they haven't worked? They often have fed into, as I outlined just before, authoritarian um, conservation practices by what many refer to today, the conservation industry, often uh, or almost always by necessity because it's over land, 
uh, in conjunction with government decisions. There is that long history of displacement and dispossession that we cannot deny and must be mindful of when thinking about how to approach biodiversity, halting biodiversity loss for the future. And I think one crucial point is when thinking about how to integrate um, biodiversity and the need to halt the biodiversity destruction in our own work is to be very aware of the rather poor track record of the conservation approach to protecting or to stemming and stopping uh, the rapid biodiversity loss, creating all the help very much to halt biodiversity loss, unfortunately. And the reason for that is also relatively obvious, um, because creating parks uh, as a way of halting biodiversity loss doesn't address the underlying causes of destruction. Um, they are largely ignored. They're in fact sometimes there in the analysis. But when you look at the initiatives taken, the action taken, there is a disjunct between the analysis of, for example, the drivers of deforestation and the activities to propose. Um, so I think for me that over the last two decades, that's become almost like a guide of a quick first assessment guide to proposed initiatives, to look at the, at the analysis part of, the, of an approach that's proposed and just see if there is coherence between the analysis and the activities and actions proposed. And I would say seven times out of 10, there is no connection. And that is a very strong warning signal, a red flag that goes up to say, hang on, you might have done a really good analysis, but that doesn't really add up with your proposed action. So if there is that disconnect, then the failure is already built into um, the proposal. Um, if the proposal doesn't have that coherence between the often good analysis and the pro proposed action. Um, another quick um, guide to getting a feeling of an initiative and a proposed approach goes into the right direction or the wrong one is to see what proposals to halt biodiversity loss have to say about the one really effective and proven um, uh, approach with a very positive uh, and yeah, good track record. And that is uh, the respect for and the strengthening of indigenous people's rights and community ter communities territorial rights. Um, when we look, um, at, a while ago, I did a quick assessment of the German government's funding for demarcation of indigenous people's lands in the um, late 80s, early 90s, up to the first years of the, the 2000s. Support for demarcation of indigenous territories was one of the recognized and proven um, effective as effective, proven as effective activities to also address biodiversity loss. Funds allocated to supporting demarcation of indigenous people's territories, of community territories, has gone down immensely. So rather than strengthen. Um, an approach that in the past has shown uh, to be very effective. We see that funding for that approach in particular, strengthening rights, demarcation of rights, supporting also auto demarcation of rights where government stood in the way of, um, of supporting the demarcation and recognition of, in of indigenous people's rights. Um, and the tendency that we see in the German government, we see in other um, government budgets as well that in general, funds um, available support, also technical support available for demarcation of indigenous peoples and community territories has significantly gone down over, over the years, um, over the last decade and a half almost. Um, so um, when we think about how can we integrate biodiversity and why does biodiversity matter and how can we make it matter better um, in our work, um, challenging the dominant narrative of what is causing private uh, biodiversity loss is a key point for us to tackle. And I think there are many really interesting ways of doing it and, and pointing out to the mismatch of good analysis, but really not very well connected um, approaches. And 
coming back to politicizing that discussion of, but where's the work on the drivers? Where is the analysis and the strengthening of those initiatives that worked um, and uh, not playing around with, with approaches that really don't have a very good record. So highlighting again, that we know what's causing um, or really causing the ecological impacts that drive biodiversity loss. It's resource extraction on the scale um, that we have been seeing. Um, it's the consumption patterns and the high consumption patterns and an elite that feed an elite lifestyle. It's the biodiversity loss due to uh, industrial agriculture, it's overfishing. When we look at the non-terrestrial um, part of biological diversity, it's urban sprawl and it's the pollution, particularly around plastics um, that we all have analyzed very well. Um, to come back to that and say, if we are serious about biodiversity, halting biodiversity loss, it is starting with really challenging idea that we can have limitless growth on a planet with very, very finite ecological uh, limits. Um, and looking only at protecting some and letting the rest of the um, land and therefore biodiversity be destroyed will take away so much that that which is protected in islands will not um, be um, sustainable either. Um, and here, I think, is another really interesting way of where we can where we can integrate um, the, the highlighting the need for looking at understanding biodiversity as part of cultural diversity and as part of something that sustains our life is by looking at how the dominant narrative um, around climate chaos is very much the same as it is around uh, biodiversity loss. Um, we see a lot of parallels there. When we look at climate chaos, we also see some very reasonable analysis that what's driving climate, climate chaos is um, the overexploitation of fossil carbon uh, and, and the fossil fuel burning uh, that feeds consumption patterns and elites lifestyles. Again, the issue that we live beyond our limits. Um, and we see the same parallel when we look at the policy discourse, um, again, the same disconnect that from the analysis, the proposed approaches to deal with the problem do not line up. Um, and we see in the, in the context of, bio, of climate chaos, the proliferation and the prioritization, prioritization of carbon markets, of market-based approaches, um, rather than a focus on really ending fossil carbon ex extraction. So dealing with symptoms rather than dealing with the, the um, cause of the problem at its root. Um, and when we look at what has been happening around biodiversity um, and halting the loss of biodiversity, the discourse, the policy discourse around that in the context of the CBD, we see that increasingly the approaches that haven't worked to halt uh, or slow down climate chaos are being imported into the CBD, the uh, discourse, the discourse around how to hold biodiversity conservation. We uh, see increased talk of nature-based solutions, um, approaches that favor uh, trading, um, destruction of biodiversity in one place, with um, restoring biodiversity in another um, around terms, biodiversity offsetting, biodiversity credit, uh, crediting, uh, something that we will dive into in more detail with concrete examples um, in, in a further session of this webinar. So there are very clear parallels in both the analysis of the drivers and the choice of narratives and instruments to address the crisis when we talk about carbon, um, climate chaos, and biodiversity loss. Uh, in both cases, part of the analysis is not so bad. The, the, um, the link to resource extraction is often made, but the narrative, that is, when we look at the narrative, that is where the first disconnect comes. When you think about biodiversity, but when you think about um, carbon chaos, uh, climate chaos, excuse me, um, in a lot of the proposed carbon market activities, 
the focus of the narrative is not industrial activity is driving um, climate chaos, uh, is releasing too much uh, fossil fuels, too much greenhouse gases. The large majority of uh, carbon projects, particularly around land and forests, carry the narrative that the destruction of forests and therefore the release of, of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, is the result of community-based use of the land. That is not in line with the analysis that was presented before. But when you look at the hundreds of carbon offset project documentation um, that exists, particularly, as I said, around forests and land, without exception, um, in the 200 plus that I have gone through, uh, the narrative is it's local communities' use of the land that needs to be stopped because they are a threat to the climate. That's ridiculous. And that is where I think we have a role to play, again, in integrating um, in the or taking a very critical look at, at those narratives and pointing all out the inconsistencies and incoherences in them. And by doing that, I think we will have a much easier work ahead to show that whether we talk about um, climate chaos or whether we talk about biodiversity loss, in reality, we're talking about symptoms of the same crisis. And in order to move ahead with halting that crisis and giving us as, as humankind a way um, or human society a way to move through those times and very, very uncertain times that are ahead uh, to recognize that we are really looking at the same crisis that has different faces, uh, different expressions and different symptoms, so to speak. But that in reality, there are um, underlying connections and it's important to, to highlight those connections so that we don't waste more time um, with looking at these crises as separate crises. That's why um, increasingly we see social movements insist that instead of using crises in the plural, they will talk about a multiple or a manifold crisis singular to underline um, that, that very um, point here that we're looking at symptoms of the same crisis, not separate crises in plural. Um, it's uh, easy, I think, or easier already to see the impact um, of focusing on false solutions to addressing a crisis when we look at, um, at the climate discourse and carbon markets, again, coming back to carbon um, market projects that focus on land use, wherever, there is a project, and I very rarely say something in 100% ever black and white uh, fashion, but in this case, I say, wherever there have been carbon projects related to land, there has been a conflict. This is an initial map. Um, the Böll dossier, uh, Christine mentioned one at the beginning that we've been working together on a, the, the dossier on the new economy of nature that's on the, on the Böll Foundation website in both English and, and, and German. Uh, there is a map that um, has, I think, a very fantastic, actually, repository of, of documentation that underlines this point that the approaches chosen on carbon really incite conflict. And one of the, the challenges that we have ahead of us is um, by integrating uh, the biodiversity um, aspects into our work to try and prevent the same happening now with market approaches also being increasingly proposed and advanced and financed to address biodiversity loss, because we will see a similar panorama. Um, I have no doubt about that, because it's about every carbon, um, carbon offset project, like every biodiversity credit or offset project, and we will come dive into the difference between those two points in, in a next series, um, they are about changing the use of the land. Um, so who is having to change the use of the land? Again, communities are obliged to change the way they use to change the to change the way they use their land. So the large polluters, be they those who destroy biodiversity or be they those who fuel climate chaos, 
can are not obliged um, to change and can continue. There is also a justice or injustice aspect um, in, in those approaches that I think we have a lot of space to think about how to integrate that um, much better and uh, very much uh, into our future work. I think I, yeah, starting to look, I, can, I think we can identify many, many ways of uh, pointing out where uh, we're heading in the wrong way and what could be good ways to head into to avert uh, more biological diversity loss. So the mismatch again, sort of the, the quick guide to assessing whether a proposed approach to halting biodiversity loss is going into the right or the wrong direction is to ask um, whether the drivers of the loss are um, addressed. If they're not, then why are we pursuing a proposal? Um, if it doesn't really squarely focus on dealing with the problem at its root. And the second sort of quick guide to uh, is a proposed uh, initiative going in the right or the wrong direction is, does it help to strengthen and recognize territorial rights of indigenous peoples and traditional communities? Because that's where the proven track record is. That's where when we do, some people did, um, I, a fantastic mapping um, overlaying uh, the demarcated indigenous territories in the Brazilian Amazon region with the intact forest areas. And there was an immense overlap. Um, intactness of forests and therewith also protection of the biological diversity of those forests was far higher even in uh, demarcated indigenous territories than it was uh, in protected areas by far and obviously much higher than in uh, the areas that were not um, either demarcated or um, identified as, as protected areas. Um, so to conclude, I think there is a choice to be made and I think there is also lots of, lots of space to engage a wider public in this discussion, whether we will really get anywhere by focusing on the small islands of let's call them museums um, of high biodiversity, or whether we really need to tackle the way the large part of the land is used, used in a very unsustainable way, be it from the agriculture perspective, be it around the question of how do we want to generate energy um, in the future? Um, do we trash more biodiversity for that? How do we manage the trade-offs? What do approaches of peoples with other cosmovisions other ways of looking at biodiversity, at respecting life in a different way. What do we have to learn from those approaches, from those ways of life to dealing with, on the one hand, having to have energy, wanting to have energy, but on the other hand, also having to realize that we are destroying as society and humanity, biodiversity at, all, at our own peril, because uh, the more diversity we lose, the less we know what we're losing and the bigger the risk that we go over a point where we lose some diversity that we afterwards realize was really key to maintaining the functioning of, of healthy ecosystems that we depend on for our own survival. Um, so that's where I would leave it and say there's lots of possibilities um, to start thinking. Um, I think much creativity also um, and much fun that can be had by thinking of how we can make more visible what's at stake and also underline, I think, much more clearly um, where we need to concentrate energy uh, because we don't have really the, the luxury to tinker around with a, approaches that we can foresee if we look closely enough that they will, they will need low, lead nowhere. I will leave it there. Um, there are a few more slides if we need to, but um, also considering the time, uh, let's use the last 20 minutes to have some discussion too. Thank you very much. And with that, I hand back to Johanna and Christine. Thank you so much, Yoda. That was really great. And I think it gave a really good overview, but deep dive at the same time into some topics already and the interrelations. Um, thank you so much. And I noticed, uh, yeah, some more people joined as well from uh, during um, while you were speaking. A lot of our colleagues, but also some uh, and some uh, people from other organizations. Is there any 
first comments. Anybody wanting to make comments or questions? Who wants to go first? I thought if everything's clear, maybe uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we can already, um, shall I say a few words about the third um, series of the webinar that we had in mind and maybe there will be some questions coming. Mm -hmm. Shall I do that? Yes, please. So um, for um, after sort of a very broad brush um, uh, overview of different aspects that we can discuss or that that come to mind when thinking about how to how to work around biodiversity and as the title says, how to make it more visible of why biodiversity matters. Um, the next session will look at the key um, approach or framework proposed within the, the CBD, the Global uh, Biodiversity Framework. Um, and a third session, uh, the proposal is to deep dive into some of the market um, focused instruments and approaches proposed be it in the CBD, be it by the corporate and conservation industry to address biodiversity loss, uh, financialization of nature, and particularly uh, the growing push for biodiversity credits and uh, the idea that destruction of biological diversity in one place is acceptable, even if it is within a World Heritage Site, um, if there is some restoration in another place. Um, and the equations and the absurdity um, that really is at the basis of that approach. Um, so the last session in the webinar series, the proposal is to look at one or two concrete examples and think about what's coming um, under the umbrella of biodiversity credits. What is the difference between a biodiversity credit and a biodiversity offset? Do we really need to bother about those differences who isn't interested in um, all of a sudden saying, oh, those things are not the same. So looking at what's the assumptions behind some of those market-based approaches, biodiversity crediting and biodiversity banks, biodiversity offsetting in particular, um, and how can we respond to them? What are the big flaws? Are we um, seeing the flaws the same? How can we respond to the proponents who say, look, this is the way to get money into conservation, into biodiversity protection. There will always be destruction. So why not go ahead with restoring what already has been destroyed as a way to avoiding more loss? So that will be the third session. And maybe to say that if you have come across any biodiversity offsetting or um, a nature bank, nature capital initiative in your own work, that would interest you in particular, feel please feel free um, to get in touch and I can consider that when choosing um, the examples um, to, to present and to discuss and, um, uh, in, in the third session. So if there's anything in particular around the big basket of financialization initiatives, be they state initiatives or be they corporate and private sector initiatives, or even a particular project that interests you where you would like to know more, um, maybe also know more about the, the inconsistencies, the contradictions that are um, inherent in the project or the impacts on community rights. Do let me know. And I, as I said, I'd be happy um, to focus on that example then to make it the best selection also uh, that works best for, for you and your work to integrate it into your work. Thank you, Jutta. If there's any qu no questions now from the round, I have a couple of questions. First of all, you were saying that uh, protection of it's like if you talk about biodiversity protection, it uh, it sometimes or it can be see it quickly gets a colonial cut, touch it away as it was executed. What kind of language can we use that makes our approach more um, clearer, or how can we how can we use different language and how can we put it so it implies a different solution? Or yeah. How we, yeah. I struggle with that too, um, because we have normalized the term biodiversity so much um, that it comes very quickly over our lips. Um, my approach, and I'm not saying I, it's experimenting still very much, um, uh, 
the way I have I am experimenting with it is saying always to to connect biological diversity with cultural diversity, um, and that way I think it makes it clearer that we're not talking about biodiversity without people. That we recognize that um, in fact the biggest biological diversity is in places that people have used for a very long time, but used in a very respectful and very different way of use than, than we understand. And I, one of the things on my list that always gets pushed away is um, there has been some really interesting scientific research that has documented um, the levels of biological diversity in uh, very old uh, systems uh, discovered in the recent years in the Amazon uh, region, not only Brazilian Amazon, but in the Amazon basin, um, where anthropological and ethnobotanical research has advanced a lot. And they have found um, that, you know, those places where the narrative always has been, people haven't been there. This is unused, untouched. Um, by no means. And the diversity that we admire today often goes back to planting, to gardening that peoples in long time, at long time past did. So a lot of what we see today as a very diverse forest are actually manipulated uh, forests, but manipulated in a careful way um, that um, that's there. So to bring that knowledge together, that scattered and that we don't really have good access to would be one way. And the other to always underline that um, protection, the question is whose land are we talking about when we talk about protection and come back to the issue, who is destroying and who is protect, uh, who, is, who is avoiding and standing up against the destruction. And where I think there are also obviously uh, regions where Local use is leading to destruction, that's undeniable. And to ask there, what is driving overuse of, of lands? Um, but to come back again to your question, I think it's the connection between biological diversity and cultural diversity and the commitment to saying whatever is um, proposed as a way to protecting biodiversity. And there we talk about biodiversity hotspots, I would say, in the first place has to be something that, that recognizes the rights and recognizes that it is that local use that is not a problem. Um, I see sort of it, in the last four or five years, the, the, the discussion around decolonizing conservation has picked up speed, but the conservation industry has also um, picked up. Uh, when you look at the um, brochures today of the large conservation organizations, they all talk about partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities. But when you go and look at the reality of how protected areas, uh, biodiversity hotspots are managed, there isn't partnership. And I think that's where we have to, again, come back to questioning, how is it that Northern-based conservation organizations in the 21st century are still the ones who think they know how to manage those places. What have they done the last 35, 40, 50 years if they haven't been able to share the skills that they think they have to enable a local management of those protected areas? No, there's, there's a lot of questions I think to, to be asked there. Um, and again, to question there, I don't think also there is one word that we can say will help us to avoid the-, the There is a proposal in the chat from Dolores, ah. biocultural diversity. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly that. So thanks for the reminder of the word, which also is getting traction indeed, yeah. And then we have a question. We have two more questions. Yiblin, do you want to, shall I read it out or do you want to open your mic yourself? It's always more lively if <laughs> people go and ask it yourself. Please go ahead, Yiblin. Yes, uh, Yuta, uh, first of all, thank you. A great presentation, great overview. And uh, it's, uh, it's very clear. We agree totally that the underlying uh, drivers are not the right ones. And we also, I represent the um, indigenous peoples. And I totally align with the thought that it's not indigenous peoples that is destroying biodiversity, but uh, the way we produce and consume our goods in more industrialized and also in uh, in countries, within countries, how uh, the urban and uh, rural areas or uh, biodiverse rich areas uh, interact. But I was wondering, okay, we, uh, we came, uh, 
we can go with that idea that uh, indigenous peoples or local communities um, are not the, the driving biodiversity uh, loss, but are actually they are keeping biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. Um, how can, which role can uh, these groups, indigenous peoples and local communities, especially, I'm going to just talk about indigenous peoples, how, uh, which role can indigenous peoples uh, could play uh, bringing these flaws in the narrative down and uh, working with civil society as a whole, uh, which uh, entry points do you see, which possibility do you see to uh, strengthen the voices of indigenous people saying this, what you are saying, that indigenous peoples have not at the base of the destruction of biodiversity, but rather they are keeping it. Mm. And uh, there I have one more comment, uh, and it's central. It's the cosmovision. Uh, the cosmovision in the cosmovision of indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples or human beings are not away or are not isolated from the biodiversity mm. and the ecosystem. They are a part of it. So they are, you know, they are called, we, the, Indigenous peoples call uh, brother, brother tree, uh, father mountain, father sun, mother earth, etc., etc., and that that reflects the fact that we are very much in the ecosystem, still in the cosmovision, and our that's also the, the biodiversity conservation is emerging from this strong feeling, uh, and that's also a, a possibility because many people in uh, more industrialized uh, uh, regions are looking for this bond, this connection, because uh, they have the feeling they have lost something and the eco crisis and et cetera is pushing more and more this, um, this search for getting back to nature. And many people think rightly that indigenous peoples still have this bond. And that was just a remark. But my question is actually, how can we work together? How can, can, can we in uh, increase the potential of indigenous people's voices in this discussion. I think by giving more recognition to the role that indigenous peoples have played in um, safeguarding biological diversity and opening our minds to getting closer to those understanding those different visions. And I wouldn't, I shouldn't even say understand, but opening our minds to grasp more of what it means to have a different cosmovision. Um, and I think there we get a long way to, for example, like I said before, to give more visibility also to the kind of research that is there that puts or underlines and documents the role of indigenous peoples as guardians of biological diversity, giving that more visibility um, than we have. I think there's a lot of space to do that much more systematically to include the indigenous peoples focused research also and findings also um, into, um, and not only you know the biologists, but also the indigenous uh, knowledge keeper. Um, I think there's, a, we have a lot still there and to always challenge our own colonial bias that we cannot run away from but that we can be aware of um, to look at how can we better write to take the time to reread something that we write and think like okay I look at this now from a different perspective if I read that what I have written trying to put myself in the shoes of somebody in the global south or of an indigenous person would I still like what I have written um, I find that you know we often rush but I actually find those kind of exercises quite helpful and they will help us also give more recognition to others, make more visible um, the, the role that indigenous peoples or traditional communities have played. I wanted to quickly um, also touching on that, um, relate to um, one point that was in the chat, how do we deal with mining and the land use both inside what's often referred to as biological diversity hotspots, but also on the land that the conservation industry considers as degraded. But there is still biological frictions there happening. And that one of the challenges I think that we have in making biodiversity matter is saying it matters on the land that industry and governments and the conservation industry want to give up for trashing. We cannot afford that. Biodiversity crisis will also be decided on the large area of land under industrial agriculture, on the large area of land under urban sprawl, on the large area of land that are undermining uh, 
and for un undermining. <laughs> so that's where we I think need to focus more. It's not just the biodiversity of the big photogenic mammals and the beautiful forests. No, it is the small biodiversity that we need to make and maintain. And that comes again back to indigenous cosmovisions where every life matters. And I think we need to slowly start to appreciate that again, to look at how we go beyond the, the our own um, understanding, upbringing, socialization, and decolonize. I think that for us as in the global north, decolonizing our minds in a lot of our work is what we face and what we should confront and what we should embrace, because it will bring us a lot to our work. Um, not as something that where we think, of, oh, how God, how, how am I going to do that? How will this, not to be blocked, but to be mindful that we have to do some unlearning of what we have learned. Um, and one of the parts is to look at biodiversity much more broadly and focus on, you know, what's the impact? How can we make biodiversity matter and biodiversity protection matter in the land that at the moment has very little biodiversity left? in how we see biodiversity. Um, and I think looking at mining, looking, addressing uh, agriculture, industrial agriculture, looking at picking up again the system, the system questions, I think will be key to us um, to, to that. Um, and uh, we will see, I think in the third session very much that the pressure on the remaining intact territories is enormous at the moment. It really is enormous. Um, like was mentioned in the chat, from the digitalization industry, from the financialization of nature industry. Um, one of the indigenous leaders from the Brazilian Amazon uh, recently pointed out to me saying, Yutai, I think there are very few indigenous communities in the Brazilian Amazon that haven't been visited in the last two years by a carbon cowboy posing um, a carbon offset project. We will see that kind of uh, pressure on indigenous communities expand and accelerate massively if the biodiversity offsetting push um, is left to go ahead. We need to, I think, be very strong and clear and say, there is no way of doing a good biodiversity offset, just as we have learned with the carbon offsetting, because if we don't try to really put the spanners in the work now, indigenous communities will be overrun, not just by the carbon, but also by the biodiversity cowboys. We will see um, the same as we saw with the bio, bio piracy rush, but on an accelerated scale. And I think that's where we have a lot of thinking to do of how we, how we express that threat, that coming threat that we can see come. Um, but I think we have more to do to, to prepare very well for that. Um, that that's something yes to definitely um, dive into maybe also in the in the third in the third session, and then so if one last point I noted here was this uh, on how to decolonize and how can we you know unlearn what are different options to phrase biodiversity. Now I, I was a indig I was a, um, a Indonesian um, farmer um, who is who had lost actually his land to uh, palm oil plantations. And in the conversation around um, responsible, uh, su supposedly responsible palm oil production under RSPO, they were asked to identify the high biodiversity and high conservation value areas of the land that they wanted to see protected. And he said, well, how, how, can, you, uh, how can you ask me to identify high value? All my land is high value for me. And I think there's, you know, that's something that's that stuck with me for a very long time. Shouldn't we start to learn and say again, making the link to other cosmovisions? All land is important. Also, the small biodiversity is important, and that's where we have to sort of make that kind of understanding of of biological diversity matter. And um, and as I said, I think we have a lot of potential when we start to creatively explore. Um, yeah, how to make those links visible, um, to move away from the big and shiny and maybe highlight more the small and nitty gritty that sort of makes the ecological integrity of, of the life system uh, work. Thank you, Jutta.
there is more mm -hmm. questions coming up there or more like that we have to how to tackle the dominant narrative in a consistent and coherent way probably mm -hmm. we could have another webinar on that <laughs> to could, think yes. about it and um yeah and i think there's many more questions i also have a lot of question marks on how we how the, is the best way how we integrate it in our work but i think that's why we continue with the discussion and uh, see how we can um yeah uh, get deeper into the topic and connect it with our with the other issues and um yeah thanks a lot for that um mm -hmm. uh, for your input and thanks a lot uh, to all of you for joining today and let's see how we uh that yeah the joint forces to work on the topic yeah. Thanks a lot, Jutta, for that. And great, glad the connection worked out well and there was yes. no <laughs> power cut today again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I see you again. Thank you very much. And on the narrative, let's look at highlighting the, the, the discrepancies that will bring us a long way. So we see you, I'll see you again. Look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Jutta. Bye.